Maternal Instinct, Chapter 10. We are so screwed. The Militant Space Center is considered by many to be one of the most advanced in the nation. Despite its rather ordinary look and setting, the scientists working in the center are on the cutting edge of space exploration technology. From new forms of rocket fuel and propulsion systems to advanced AIs for unmanned vessels and rovers, the staff works hard to get to a man to the stars that much sooner. While this is generally considered a team effort, there are individuals who like to take more credit than they should. One says the person is Dr. Franklin McCoy. Though a recent hire to the Robotics and Center Division, he brought with him a completely new AI program to revolutionize the field. Much to the chagrin of his colleagues, he not only knows how important his work is, but how about it quite frequently. Needless to say, it causes a great deal of animosity towards him from his co-workers, even though most of the work done at the center is supposed to be top secret. A moment of alcohol fueled ranting and raving can lead to some of the secrets slipping out. The public and or was such rumors. Look, as long as the, this doesn't begin the slow decline towards Cybermen, I'm fine. What? This is not a random joke. Doctor Who's canon in this universe. This is possible? Goes on an adventure with the Doctor. This was how the knowledge of Dr. McCoy's latest breakthrough, the X-23 personality chip, was brought to the attention of three dubious characters. Upon hearing the chip, they knew it was the perfect thing they needed to complete their plans. They waited until nightfall, when security was at its weakest before striking. Not that they really needed to wait, as they would have run into the lab, grabbed the chip, and exited before anyone could see them, even at the security's highest points. But they learned of past failures that discretion was called for in these sentences. So they stood in the darkness in the main lab of the Center's Robotics Division. The only entrance of their presence was the soft, red glow of their eyes. They scanned over the desk and computer consoles until they spotted a large sealed door near the side of the room. They walked over to it in uniform precision, the sound of metal clanking against metal echoing throughout the lab as they did so. When they reached the door, the figure in the far right stepped forward and inspected a number of pads set into the wall under the door. His eyes began to search through all the visible spectrums until it was able to pick up the faint imprint of oil and skin from a human figure, revealing the numbers needed to be pressed to open the door. A blue, metallic hand glistened in the soft light of the lab as he reached up for the pad and a blink of eye ran through all the possible combinations. A small ping sound rang out with correct code, illuminated the pedestal, was entered, followed by a quicker by the sound of air decompressing and the slow door slowly swinging open. The three intruders stepped inside, and a single light in the small room not only illuminated the pestle holding the chip and glass case in, but also revealed the thieves' feminine forms. They gathered around the pestle, synthetic blonde hair lightly bouncing with their every move, though their faces were almost expressless pieces of metal, their eyes simply lights. Some were present, they could swear they saw them looking at the chip in anticipation. The X-23 chip, one of them said matter-of-factly. With this powering our new queen, we will finally achieve our goal. The other one added. Yes, at long last, the third stated. Babies will be perfect, they stated in unison as their red eyes flashed menacingly. Ken sat contently as he leaned back into the couch and watched TV. It was one of the few truly peaceful moments she had in about eight months. Not that her life was chaotic, wasn't chaotic before then, but at that time she didn't have to worry about being a parent. On the fact that she was in a relationship with another woman. The fact that the woman she was in a relationship with, and who was carrying her baby, which was wearing it itself, was her former arch rival, made the situation even more extraordinary. But surprisingly enough, she found herself adapting rather quickly to this new relationship. She and Sego had been an official couple for about a month now. It was going rather well. Kim still has her reservations about it, given how her last relationship ended does lead to the idea of being with another woman. She go playfully, natural for Tasha's side, didn't do much to help matters, nor did the fact that it was amplified by her overactive hormones, which led her to suggest things Kim really wasn't ready for. It was the quiet moments, like the ones we were having now, that helped Kim feel comfortable about her situation. While she sat on the couch, she could lay her head down next to her, laying on the redhead's lap. 
Her left hand was crossed over her breast, holding the remote, while her right dangled lazily out the couch. For her part, Kim was stroking Seagull's soft, silky hair with her right hand, while her lips was gently caressing her plump stomach. In total, it had been nine months since Seagull first became pregnant, and according to Dr. Anderson, she was due any day now. Something that Seagull was immensely happy about. It would be nice to do things on her own again, without everyone making a fuss over her. While that had been nice at first, it quickly grew tiresome. She just wanted to be more active and independent again. Plus, she was curious to see what this thing she had been carrying around all this time looked like. They both gasped as she felt the baby kick. <laughs> Quite a kick she's got, Kim said with a smile. Maybe she'll end up being a soccer player. She got let out groan. What? What is it? Kim asked, slightly panic. You're using that stupid cliche. She got retorted. Why is it that every time a baby kicks, someone has to make that joke? Because most people know it as the only sport where you use your feet a lot, the redhead offered. There's also kickboxing, which, knowing us, is far more likely for her than soccer. True. Besides, if she did go into soccer, I wouldn't let you coach her. What's that supposed to mean? Kim asked indignantly. She couldn't help but smirk at the reaction. Oh, I heard about how you went crazy on those poor kids when you coached. Gotta say, princess, didn't know you had it in you to be so cruel. I was not that bad, she huffed. And the tweeds told you this, and they're exaggerating to make me look bad. Edgley was wrong. Kim faltered that. Well, I well, still wasn't that bad. The way I hear it, the new coach yells at them and threatens to cut off their limbs, and they still prefer him to you. The only response was the hand leaving Kiko's hair to rest on the couch. While she was a little disappointed at being taken away, she couldn't help but smirk at a small victory. They may not actually be fighting anymore. But there were still little competitions between them, and she definitely won this round. The fun was cut short by the familiar beeping of the communicator. Dee -dee -dee. Kim did her best to try and not to disturb Shiko, as she flushed around her pocket for the device. She flipped it on as she found it and held it up to her face. What's the situation? she asked. Trouble at Milton Space Center, he replied. Kim's face paled as a horrific thought crossed her face. Is my dad alright? she asked quickly. He's fine, Wait, he said quickly. This hit came from a Dr. McCoy. He's, well, pretty much demanding your help. After seeing let out a sigh of relief, Kim picked up the choice of words. Demanding? Yeah. He's pretty adamant about you helping him and finding an experimental chip. Any idea what it is? Nope. Wait, he answered with his head. He said he'll only tell you in person. Alright, well tell him I'm on my way, and I'll stop off and get Ron. On it, Kim. Please and thank you, she said before turning off the communicator. She then sighed and looked down at Shigo. Sorry, duty calls. Shigo let out a small groan of protest before propping herself on her shoulders so Kim could slide off the couch. Once he did, she placed the pillow where her legs had been to make Shigo a little more comfortable. Lucky, Shigo muttered. What? I say you're lucky. What? You actually want to help people now? Kim said with a hit of amusement. I want to do something. I'm tired of sitting around here all day. Now there's a surprise, the redhead smirk, before she stepped towards the cows and placed a hand on Shigo's stomach. Just concentrate on having her first. Then we'll talk about you helping people. Fine, Shigo huffed. Don't at least get a kiss before you go. Kim shook her head a bit, then held her back back with a left hand, leaning forward and gave the pale woman a quick peck on the lips. She stood straight again and went back to walking towards her room to get ready for this latest mission. She just hoped it would be a quick and easy one, as she didn't want to ruin the risk of being half a world away while her daughter was being born. Ron sighed as he stared at his grande-sized knockout combo meal. Usually just a sight of his own creation was enough to cheer him up. By the moment, he was the only one who was really enjoying it was Rufus. Just as at least he could take some comfort in knowing it wasn't going to go to waste. He wasn't really sure what he ordered, as he wasn't really hungry. It was more about having than anything else. Usually when he came here, he would order the combo meal, sit down, and talk with... He sighed again and lowered his head. What's wrong, wrong man? Wrong lifted his head up and looked at the person sitting across from the booth. The spot that was usually occupied by Kim was now taken by Felix Wren, the boy with the amazing cybertonic wheelchair that was sat next to the table that he persisted himself in the booth. While Ron was always happy to spend time with his other best friend, just fell off not having Kim around as much. It's nothing, he tried to lie. It's just... 
Still trying to wrap your brain around the whole Kim Shigo thing? Felix ventured. The blonde boy gave him a surprised look. How did you... Oh, right, you're on my friends list. But yeah, that's it. I mean, I know I promised Kim I'd still be there for her, but it's just weird not having her around all the time. Plus, I still think those to get together spells wrong, Shek. Is it the fact that she's going out with another woman that's got you freaked? Or the fact that it's Shigo? Definitely the Shigo thing. I mean, yeah, I would have freaked if she had just been going out with another woman. But was the woman that's trying to kill her? What sense does that sense make? No, that's what. Well, she is. Ron stopped his friend by holding his hand. Do not bring up the baby again. He requested. That's what everyone says, and it's getting old. But it's true. Felix carried. It was still old. Yeah, old. Chris squeaked. Either way, it's a big change for her. You just gotta wait till she sells into it. After that, I'm sure everything will go back to normal. Things will never be normal again. Ron mutters. He crossed his arms over his chest. Are you the one who's always saying it will never be normal? Felix remarked with a grin. The other boy failed for an answer for a second before he narrowed his eyes at his friend. Curse your logic! He growled. Felix chuckled a bit as he held up a knuckle from his own meal. He waited until it was significant to you before speaking again. Now, are you sure the real reason you're freaking out is it because you moved on and you haven't? He asked. He had Ron was silent for a moment before laying his elbows on the table and cranking his head with his hands. Honestly, that probably is it, he admitted. I was just having a hard time accepting that she found someone else, especially with how caught I still am with her. Maybe she'd be going through the same thing, but nope. Turns out she just goes out and finds someone else. Somehow I doubt it was as easy as that, Felix said. Still doesn't change the fact that she had someone else, and I don't. Then why not go out there and find someone for you? Oh yeah, like it's that easy. You never know until you try. Why don't you talk to Tara? She seemed to like you. Yeah, like. Ron stressed the word. As it used to, and doesn't anymore. Besides, she's going out with Josh Ma the Monkey. Monkey, monkey, he spoke. Ah, Josh Mankey. Just because it's the last century. Hello! Actually, I heard they broke up. Ron stared at Felix. Don't play me here, Felix, he warned. I'm dead serious, he replied, holding his hand up at a scout's arm gesture. Keep in mind, this comes from the usual high school gossip bin, so I have no idea how reliable it is. Fair enough, Ron said. But it's still something I had to when I had before. There you go. And if that doesn't work, you can look up that Jen Credible girl again. I think I remembered reading you said you, she was cute. That is true, she was. Ron rubbed his chin. But I'm not sure how long I can handle all the supernatural demon stuff. I mean, it was really weird. Like, worse than the monkey power stuff. And then there were the times she seemed a little too... Intense. How intense? Kim, soccer coach, intense. Oh, yeah. The two lasted in silence before going back to their proper meals. The talk seemed to help Ron regain his appetite. Well, unfortunately, he still wasn't enjoying his knocko as Kim walked through the door right as he took his first bite. Her personal stride up to the table told him that mission had come up. Well, that and the fact that he was dug out in missing gear. Hey, Keepy! He agreed, trying to sound tearful. Got a mission? Yep. Kim replied as he moved a hand on the table. There was the other person there. Oh, hey, Felix. Yo. He replied with a small wave. So, where are we going? Not far. Something has stolen from the Milton Science Center, and we need to talk to a scientist before we can get it back. He nodded as he took large bites out of his knocko, trying to enjoy as much of it as he could. As he took back the food, Kim noticed a strange look in his eye. That wasn't as usual as shoving down large amount of food to look. Ron, are you okay? She asked. No, I'm totally completely miserable without you. I don't hear the don't you go take me back. He thought. After facing his fights, he said out loud, I'm fine, KP. You sure? Kim asked again, not sounding convinced. No! Yep, 100 okay. Kim stood straight with her arms crossed and glared down at him. She has a feeling he wasn't being entirely truthful. Unfortunately, didn't have time to talk about it right now. Then, when we're ready to get going, I already stopped by your house and picked up some missing clothes for you. You got chains on the way there, she said. All right. He replied to turn to Felix. Well, hate to do this, buddy, but, you know, duty calls. Ah, I'll be fine. 
feel like someone just missed a way. Go on and see the world again. The pair smiled at him and said their goodbyes before turning and walking out the fast food restaurant. Rufus jumping into Ron's pocket as he did so. She watched them leave. Felix wondered when or even Ron would come clean about his lingering feelings for Kim. At the very least, he wondered if it would have some effect on the mission. I'm sure he'll feel fine, just like always. He tried to convince himself, but couldn't shake his bad feeling. The drive to Middleton Science Center was uncomfortably quiet. The most noise either came from the radio, or Ron struggled to change to his missing calls in the back seat. Beyond that, there was little to no talking between the two. Kim had a feeling it was because Ron was still adjusting to the idea of her and Shigo, and just didn't want to talk about it. There was something else, though. A hint of something she spotted in his eye at Bueno Naxo. It was something that she had seen a few times on her mission since her new relationship began. She had sinking seeking feelings she knew what it was. Unfortunately, since both of their recent time together was either in school or on missions, she hadn't really been sat down with him and talking through. She thought now might be a good time, but once she realized she was so close to the science there, she knew she had to go into mission mode. Before she did, however, she resolved herself to find time to have a long talk with Ron to get everything sorted out. As they approached the science entrance to the stair, they were met with a very familiar voice. Give me a cup! Dr. Possible agreed happily as he walked through the floor and gave her father a hug. Hey, Dad. I'm glad you're okay. He replied as he returned the hug. He gave her a perplexed look as he pulled back. Why shouldn't that be? He asked. Well, I just... Kim passed out to shook her head. Never mind. Can you take me to the Zist Dr. McCoy? From what Wade told me, he's very adamant about seeing me. Oh, yes. He is very, well, I suppose, adamant is the most politely way to put it. Come on, I'll show you to his lab. With that, he turned and walked to the center, with the two teen heroes falling close behind. Having been there a few times before on a mission, visits to her father, and more Rocket Boosters club trips than she cared to admit, Kim knew her way around the main part of the center very well. What she wasn't that familiar with was the robotics division having been only there once, and how about with who she thought was a robotics expert? It really turned out to be a fraud. It all worked out well in the end, though, when she helped reveal the real genius, Dr. Vivian Porter, and helped her get a job at the center. Now she was here again, about to meet another genius with another robotics problem. At least that's what she assumed, since the details were rather sketchy at the moment. No doubt due to the secret nature of this division. Dr. Possible stopped just before the rounded metal double doors and turned back to his daughter. Well, Kimmy Cub, this is about as far as I can take you. My clients will get me in here, but Dr. McCoy is very particular about who he lets in. Besides, I still have my own work to do. Gotta get back to those loss vectors and make sure the new cells are going to crash. It's okay. I guess I'll see you tonight at dinner then, Kim said. You betcha, Dr. Possible replied before he entered his coach with a keypad to open the doors. He slid open with a white whoosh. And after a final wave to her father, Kim and Ron walked into the lab. The scene he saw inside it would fit right at home in any sci-fi movie. The walls and floor were all steel gray doors, with everything looking clean and pristine. A handful of desks sat along with dozens of flat computer monitors, lap set on spike gears. Circuits and half finished robots sat on things that looked like metal beds. Some were human shaped by most like, and some of them were insect like. Ryan let an impressive whistle as he took it all in. Wow! I bet Wade would have a field day in here, he joked. Actually, knowing Wade, this would probably be very mundane to him, Kim coward. Who's there? A voice called out from behind one of the larger pieces of machinery. Kim Possible. I got a hit from Dr. McCoy saying he needed my help, Kim called out. Oh, it's about time, the man shouted as he stepped to the light. How did Dirksy know that you were not going to resist doing the Dr. McCoy joke? Oh, you know me too well, Trix. You know me too well. Kim recoiled a bit for the unexpected outburst. Out of all the ways people have greeted her over the years, that was definitely the rudest. Once he recovered, she took a moment to look the man over. Like almost everyone in the center, he was wearing a white lab coat with a few pens and a small notebook shoved into his breast pocket. Underneath the coat, he had a simple dark red business shirt with black slacks all fitting rather loosely to try and hide the fact he wasn't in the best of shape. While highly overweight, from what Kim could tell, he could stand out to get out of the lab more often. He set the piece of equipment he was working on down and walked over to them. The soft lights of the lab reflecting off his short, black hair 
Her feeling that he was already beginning to recede, even though he was only in his mid-thirties. He saw Dustin Forever seemed to be giving her and Ron the same evaluative look she was giving him. So he's a colored eye, so there skeptically as he crossed his arms over his chest. So, you're a kid impossible, huh? When the way your father talks about you is really expecting something more, he mused. Moving right along, Kim said, ignoring the Finley disguised insult. You told Wade you had some kind of ships been stolen? Yeah, the X-23 chip. It's my last work. You understand, I'm a little anxious to get it back. So, what's it do? It thinks. It thinks. Yeah, it thinks. Or rather, the programming inside us is it think. Isn't that what AI was supposed to do? Kim asked. Not like this, the doctor remarked, holding up a correcting figure. See, most AI is programmed to react to its environment and learn from those experiences. Now, while the X-23 does operate on the same principles designed to predict certain actions, make guesses as to what happened. Basically, it'll give any machine or robot it's plugged into the same capabilities as this. He pointed and said, Your head? Ron asked. Dr. McCoy gave him a you gotta be kidding look. No, the brain. Basically, what I'm doing with this chip is creating life. Well, no offense, Doctor, but women have been doing that for millions of years. Kim pointed out. He shook his head incredibly. No one understands my work. It's not that we don't understand it, Frank. So you presented it the wrong way. A new voice spoke up. Kim and Ron turned to the sound of this familiar voice and saw who exactly they expected to see walking into the room. Doctor Fibian Porter. Like Doctor McCoy, she had a white lab coat on. But it was over a light blue to low cut t shirt, more professional lurking skirt than the last one Kim seen on her. The redhead smiled as he walked up to the blonde woman. Dr. Porter, it's good to see you again. She greeted with a hand out stretched. Please, call me Vivian. The scientist replied she offered her hand and shook it. So, what have you been up to, Vivian? Ron asked. She stepped forward over his own hand. Oh, about the same, she replied, shaking his hand. Working on the upgrade for Oliver, trying to get my colleagues to take me seriously, and mostly trying to keep Frank here in line. I don't need to be kept in line, Dr. McCoy protested. You ran off most of our interns just this past month, Vivian protested. They're getting in the way. How would they even manage to get this far is amazing. They can barely understand the basic algorithms of the code, and don't even get me started on their lack of knowledge on motor control functions. Huh. See what I mean? The blonde pointed to Kim. Uh, sure, Kim replied. I feel like completely lost the conversation. Let's just say I miss Dr. Freeman. Oh uh, yeah, Dr. Freeman. The man who decided to give a poster of personality. Dr. McCoy snipped. Hey, he's also invented a talking self driving car, Ron pointed out. Good for him. He invented a sister to the car for Night Rider. I, however, decided something would be the first major breakthrough in the 21st century, and I can't ignore because I don't have people skills. Which is kind of right when you think about it, considering the fact we're working with robots. Maybe we should get back to the matter at hand, Ken suggested. Of course. Roll me a sleeve to vault, the doctor said, before he turned and headed towards another part of the lab. Kim and Ron shrugged his name Vault, but it followed him after a quick goodbye to Vivian. When they reached the far end of the lab, they did, in fact, find something that very much resembled a bank vault, right down to the very heavy steel door which was currently swung open. Dr. McCoy sat next to a small pestle as he waited for them to enter. Well, here it is, or rather, was, he said, gesturing towards the pestle. Kim placed her hands on her knees as he leaned forward to examine the structure. I take it the ketchup was sitting in something, right? She asked, glancing at the scientist. Yeah. We kept it in a hyperbarically sealed class to continue to keep it clean. It was supposed to keep it safe, but obviously that didn't really work out. Does you all have some sort of alarms and stuff to keep that stuff from happening? Ron asked. Does he always ask stupid questions? McCoy muttered towards Kim. Before he could answer, though, he spoke up again. Yes, there are security measures in place, but they were all shut off. Which is what makes this situation really strange, because they weren't shut off by any of our people. The subroutines decided to set it off on another alarm system if one of them was tampered with. So to be able to sum all off without tripping one would require an impressive amount of speed. Speed? Kim asked a sudden seeking feeling in her stomach. Yes, speed. Doctor, is there a security camera in here? Of course. In fact, there's even a monitor built in here somewhere. He turned towards the row of doors behind him, skinned over their number of labels until he found the right one. Ah, here it is. He mused as he pulled it open. 
Immediately, a small monitor and control panel opened up. Gimmerron walked over to it as Dr. McCoy began to call the security feed. I did check it earlier, found something rather interesting. I was only there for a second, but still. He said as he stopped the team, right after the door had been opened, and three figures stepped inside. There! This is the reason I called you in! Kim's eyes narrowed as his business were confirmed. On the play flag was black and white, and slightly gray, so he would recognize those three anywhere. The babies! She exclaimed. The babies? Oh man, I thought you destroyed them! Ron complained. Me too. Guess some got them away. Those things are hard to kill like cockroaches! Mm, cockroaches! Rufus added as he poked his head out of Ron's stomach. So, yeah, you know him? Dr. McCoy stated. Unfortunately, Kim remarked. They were created by my arch enemy, Dr. Dragon, to be some kind of perfect weapon or something. I thought they were designed to be his girlfriend, Ron asked. I think that was just in college. Dr. McCoy cast a rear look between the two heroes, recording his start to draw their attention. So, what do you think they want with my chip? He asked. Well, last time we fought them, they were looking for a new queen to rule their hive mind. You know, like bees. Maybe they decided they can't find a new queen, then just build one. I tried to use the X-23 chip to give her a personality. The scientist surmised. Then he got a very horrific look on his face. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What's uh-oh? Oh, man, I don't want to be hearing any uh-ohs. Those look never good! Ron shouts, basically. Well, keep in mind, this is just a theory. But they wanted to use the chip to give their queen a personality. They would have to set their moral code to concede with, con with theirs. What do you mean? Like I explained earlier, the chip could give any computer or robot a very close facility a laugh. But it's very basic core. It's still a computer chip. It still needs to be programmed. I haven't gotten that far yet, so it's still blank. Obviously, I would have to set the program to obey the laws of society. No killing, no stealing, how to enter a public sitting, things like that. But they figure out the program to have to be more of less evil. If you simply want to simplify things, it could be very bad. How bad? He seemed to think about it for a second. Oh God, oh God, we're all going to die, he offered. Kim stared at her for a second before spinning around on her heel. We opened the communicator as he exited the vault. Wade, we got sits here. She spoke up after switching it on. What's up? Wade asked. Can't see the urgency in her voice. The babies are back. Do you still have a pair of those super fast suits? Actually, I have one better. Stop by and I'll show it to you. Stop by? As in, go to your house? Ron asked excitedly. Amp down, Ron, Kim said. Wade, we'll be there as quickly as we can. I'll be waiting. Kim nodded, turned off the communicator before turning it to her pocket. She turned back to Dr. McCoy again and gave her the best, everything's going to be fine luck. Don't worry, Dr. McCoy. Look at your chip back before the babies have any chance to use it, she tried to convince. Now you should be going. Now, very quickly, he said, gesturing to leave. Kim finally let her annoyance get to her, cast an angry glare before she and Ron walked out of the lab. She barely noticed Vivian passing them as the redhead stormed out, leaving the attractive scientist to see her head in amusement as she walked... Well, I'll talk to Dr. McCoy. So, what do you do now? She asked playfully. Nothing, he replied, a bit too quickly and loudly. Everything's going to get fine. They'll get the chip back, and we'll get back right to work as if nothing ever happened. He turned away and added under his breath. I hope. Miles away from the science center, on the other side of town, stood the warehouse district of Milton. Most of the buildings there were from the town's industrial period to this corner of the century, all has since been abandoned in favor of sturdier, more healthy places of work. The only reason they had not been torn down already was because the historical society was in a heated battle with the city council to get the area labeled as a historic landmark. Unfortunately, this preserving of history was endangering the future of Milton citizens as well as the rest of the world. Since the buildings looked old and dilapidated on the outside, no one ever thought to look on the insides, which is exactly what the occupants of one of the buildings counted on. So he set it up to be their new base, which they called it the Hive. Inside, the rundown exterior were brand new metal to walls and floors, each designed to resemble those of a beehive. In the middle of the Red House's mid-session stood a large assembly line that seemed to be putting itself together. In reality, it was being constructed by three robots that moved faster than the human eye could see, so as the guiding lo looker it appeared to be building itself. Slightly removed from the construction, in a separate part of a building, a figure sat perfectly still in the dark. Like those who had created, the figure was humanoid and feminine. 
I was created a confidence and power they seemed to lack. It was what they desired, a perfect queen to lead them. Although she was chronologically only a few hours old, she already knew more than most humans learn in their lifetime. It was this great knowledge that came to her in a combination of advanced circuitry that made up her brain, as well as the wires placed at the back of her neck, from her throne to provide her with internet access. She mentally scrolled through thousands of pages per second. She couldn't help but marvel at how amazingly easy the humans made it for her to learn their history. It's information she planned to put to great use. Her browsing was interrupted again by the rhythmic sound of three set metal feet clanging against the metal floor. She stopped her browsing and returned to the wires before she leaned back into the throne, regarded the three babies who have given her life and now obeyed her every command. Speak, she ordered as a red eyes flashed. The baby assembly line is complete, my queen. The male baby formed. The protection of the hive is well underway. Excellent, the queen replied. Now you three have completed the task. I have another mission for you. We are your command, the three spoke at one. I know, and I am grateful for that. Now, during my searching of the human's internet and subsidiary internet, I learned that our biggest threat is a girl named Kim Possible. Yes, we have battled her twice before, and she has beaten us twice before. I know, the queen said, a hint of anger in her voice. But that will soon change. There are certain factors that work in our favor this time. You not only have me to command you, but there is also the fact that her once former enemy Shigo is now living with her and carrying her child. From what I have gathered, humans will go to great lengths to protect their young. We shall use this response to lure Kim Possible into a trap, and Shigo will be our bait. I also wish to study this child, as I understand that such a coupling is very unique. I believe it may hold secrets we can use to improve ourselves further. But baby, babies are imperfect. You now have to lead us and guide us. We do not need anything else, the baby in the middle spoke again. There are always ways to improve oneself. You may have me to guide you, but we are all still from far from perfect. Rest assured, we will reach our goals soon enough, the queen mused. Now go, bring me Shigo, and while you're out, bring me the creator as well. I wanted to see what his hard work accomplished. By your command, the baby said in unison, before fancy a blink of eye. A small smile played across the queen's face as those workers went out to accomplish their task. She could hear the soft hum of the assembly line and feel it fair every new baby unit came online. Soon, they would be ready to show the world their new power. Why is the Cyberman theme playing in my head? The drive over to the Waste House was a little more exciting than the one to the Science Center, and for no other reason than Ron's eagerness to see Wayne in person once again. While the boy genius did get out of his room a little more, since the whole incident would seem impossible, he still preferred to stay inside and talk to them, find a communicator, or to pulse the surface if he had to actually send him something. So Kim could see how Ron would get excited at having Isley go to Wade's house for a gadget. Truth be told, she was a little excited herself. It didn't seem like a sort of special occasion. So he just wished it was under better circumstances. When he arrived at the address Wade had given them, they were surprised at how normal it looked. It was a fairly modest one-story home that would have been perfect with any idea of a suburban home. It certainly didn't seem like the kind of pl place a super genius would live in. Not even a ten-year-old super genius. You're sure this is the right place? Ron asked as the car pulled into the driveway. Yeah, this is the address he gave me. Kim said, looking as scheduled as him. Guess we'll find out soon enough. As she parked the car, the two got out and approached the house across the lake. So he's expecting someone to jump out with a shotgun and tell them the girls they're laying. Thankfully, when the door opened, the smiling face of Wade's mother greeted them. Hi, Kim. Hi, Ron. She happily greeted them. Hi, Mrs. Load. The two greeted back. You can come on in, but you have to wait a bit. Wade's already talking to someone else in his room right now. So he explained she stepped inside and motioned for them to come on in. Someone else? They asked in surprise as they stared at each other in disbelief. Once they got over their surprise, they stepped inside and followed Mrs. Lowe down a hallway lined with family pictures, as well as various prizes and accolades Wade had won over his young life. Even Kim was impressed by it all. It was easy to forget that the person they were going to see was a 10-year-old boy. It is still, it helped to emphasize her that Wade wasn't just one of her close friends, but one of her best tools she had had in a fight against the bad guys. She held her new relationship to put a strain on her friendship. He seemed to be okay with it for the moment. 
giving seem to be able to look at him without a goal anywhere. So you wonder if maybe he wasn't still following Shigo's activities, just to be sure. Her thoughts were cut off when Wei's mother suddenly stopped in front of them. Kim had to use every bit of her finely honed agility to keep from bumping into the woman. Thankfully, she recovered without either Mrs. Slode or Ron seeming to notice, and grateful that she had been spared that bit of embarrassment. Well, here you are, Mrs. Slode said, gesturing to the door at the end of the hallway. That's Wei's room, but like I said, you'll have to wait a bit. Her words were cut off when the door opened, and an African-American woman dressed in a dark gray business suit stepped out. Before fully stepping in the hallway, she turned back around to address Wade one more time, her long blown hair falling behind her as she did. I really wish you could reconsider, Mr. Lode. Eureka could use some of your talents, she said. Please, just call me Agent Wade, Agent Blake, the boy said, and I'm sorry, it definitely sounds like a nice place, but I like you here for now. Fair enough. But if you do change your mind, give us a call. We'll do. As he smiled, she shook his hand one last time before walking down the wet hallway, giving a quick goodbye and thanks to Mrs. Lode, and expected not in Kim and Ron's direction. It was only when she passed by did Kim know his apartment of defense face clicked on the left breast of the woman's jacket. She did a double take and walked up to Wade with a bit of a daze. What was... Kim asked, trying to think about the question. Sorry, Kim. Can't talk about it. Wade said, holding up his hands and shaking his head. Classified stuff. All right, Kim accepted, albeit reluctantly. What did you want to show me? Come on in, I'll show you. Well, wait, not only do we go around Wade's house, but always in his room? Ron asked him softly, his favorite sanctuary, his secret lab where he makes all his secret offenses? See, Ron, when you put it that way, you make me sound like some kind of mad scientist or something. Wade remarked with a slight plus. Well, I wouldn't say mad, more like well adjusted scientist. How about just a friend who likes to help out? Kim suggested. Yeah, that works, Ron admitted. Right, now that we got that taken care of, Wade, I believe you had something to show me? She asked, turning back to the computer genius. Right this way, Kim. Wade replied, leading into his room. What they found inside more than met their expectations of how the young super genius lived. The familiar central hub he always spoke to them sat on the far end of the room. While cables ran across the floor, connecting it to other computers, sitting in various places throughout the room. Half of the walls and floors were painted black, with a yellow grid pattern indicating the hollow suite he used to make his mother to the beats during Mother's Day. The only thing that was mostly normal was the bed space, also surprisingly plain. A mid-sized bed set tucked into the corner, with a nightstand next to it. A dresser nearby and a large double door caused it topping things off. What did set it apart from their homes were mainly the half-finished gadgets thrown about. I think you're right, KP, Ron said as he looked around. The lab at the science center has nothing on this place. Told ya, Kim smirked. Uh, is this something I should know about? Wade asked, suddenly feeling self-conscious. It's nothing, she so waved it off. Now, you said you wanted to show me something that would help me fight the BBs? Right, stay right there. You already walked to the closet. He slid one of the doors open, and after a bit of fishing around, pulled out an article of clothing with a protective wrap over it. When he walked over to Kim and Ron, he held it to the hanger and unset the covering in dramatic fashion to reveal a white bodysuit with a light blue stripe riding across the upper torso, as well as a few stripes on the arms. Felt the same color as the stripes hung over the hanger as well. Dude, the super suit! Ron blurted out. I remember that for the time we, uh. He paused to look at Kim, who looked at him back at him. Though he didn't complete this sentence, they both knew what he was going to say, and the residual feelings had dredged up. Um, the time we fought the little Diablos, he finished lamely. An uncomfortable silence had fell up the group afterwards. While Wade merely visited around nervously, him and Ron were mentally kicking themselves for how they were feeling. After all this time, given what's happening recently, they thought they had gotten over everything. Or at least Kim did. Ron wasn't quite sure how he felt. Anyway... Wade spoke up, breaking the silence. After the little Diablos mission, I went back to make some upgrades to the suit. One of which included adding circuitry from the super speed suits, so he could move as fast as you did when you had them. But it's more controlled now. No more getting stuck in hyper time. Spankin! Kim mused as he took the suit from him. Anything else I see now about? Uh, just a few things to enhance your natural agility, strength, endurance, things like that. Strength? Well, you won't be able to throw crawlers around. But well, you should be able to lay out a few robots without feeling the effects. See, smart. That's definitely gonna come in handy. So, do you have anywhere I could change? 
bathroom's right over there, Wade said, pointing to a second door in his room. Thanks, she said, turned, and started to walk towards it. She was stopped about midway, when something occurred to her. Wade, you don't have any camera set up in there, do you? Ron, Wade grins, and slid out a disgusting groan. You know that's the last place I want a camera. I was just checking since you seem to have everyone else. Please, Kim, I'm not that interested in what people are doing. She nods at the bathroom, quickly shutting the door behind her. Ron stared at the door for a second, before he turned away with a conspiracy look on his face. So, you really don't have cameras set up there, right? Yes, secretly hoping the answer would be yes. Wade just shook his head, disgusted, walked over to his control pump, start looking for where the BB is right behind out now. What? I was just curious, Ron remarked. After Kim had left, Seiko tried to find something interesting in Watts, but the monotony of daytime television come by the fact that she had to get out to pee every ten minutes, quickly knocked her out. Once again, she was asleep on the possible family couch, with her milk clutched in her left hand, her right hand dangling off the table. She was in such a deep sleep that she failed to sense the presence of a twin set of eyes staring intently at her belly, or the mischievous boys he belonged to. Jim and Tim stood fixing on the large partition, as if they were egg from an alien creature ready to hatch. So, what do you think it'll look like? Jim asked as he gave Chico's stomach a tentative poke. Well, supposed to have half a Kim's DNA, right? Tim asked, poking the stomach. So he could bet on it being half ugly. They stickered the joke at her sister's expense, went back to her valley of ice, and... Yeah, but it's going to have half her DNA, Jim countered, pointing a thumb at the still-sleeping Chico. So it means it might be all mutating and stuff. Yeah, or like having her powers, or... Like ha having four arms and things like that. Who knows what it'll be? I do. A new voice spoke. The two twins slowly turned their heads to see how fully awake Shigo glaring at them angrily. They gulped nervously and began to back slowly away. She's going to be a girl with two less uncles if you leave me the hell alone! Shigo growled as he took a swipe out with her right hand. He easily had a yelp of terror as he jumped back and quickly filled the room. Shigo struggled to pull herself off the couch to chase him, but by the time she got to her feet, it didn't seem worthy. Oh well, might as well get something to eat while I'm up, she muttered to herself. Slow, unfortunately, before she could even lift a foot, a loud crash filled the house, and at first she thought the twins had run into something in their desperate escape from her. That theory was quickly proven wrong when the three blue-skinned, blonde female robots dressed in black leotards appeared for her. What the hell?! she cried out of surprise. As he tried to take a fighting stance. Shigo, you are to come with us by order of our queen. One of the robots spoke. Sorry, but go ahead to decline your invitation. She remarked, igniting her hands. Then she gasped when it finally quit fighting was so familiar. Wait a minute. I know you. You're those stupid robots dragon built because he couldn't get a date. Negative. One of the babies spoke. We are the newer models built to exact revenge on those who marked Dr. Draken. Because he couldn't get a date in college, she goes to rise. So he built your predecessors to go to some dance with him, and even that didn't work out. Trust me, I've heard the story more than I care to admit. So, is this some kind of revenge thing for me leaving him? No, we do not work for someone so imperfect anymore, the third BB spoke. We now have a new queen, and she demands we bring you to her. Well, good luck, Trey, because I ain't going down without a fight. Yes. The first BB star did see to disappear. You are! She got a little shock gasp. Was he noticed the voice was now next to her left ear? She turned her head to find the robot standing behind her, holding her hands to her back. So she tried to break the control again. She realized that her hands were being held. Why did she sign a shackle? No! We'll be taking prisoner again! Her mind screamed. Her instincts called out to her. She had a backflip, then we lost her over to the demented robot and regained her footing. But just in case in recent months, her body simply couldn't meet those demands anymore. So instead, she continued to try and break, or pick the lock on her shackles. Your resistance is futile, the baby spoke. You're coming at us one way. She paused, bring up a hand to strike Shigo across the back of the head, hard enough to knock her out. Or another. Mission accomplished. Subject Shigo has been captured. We must now return to the hive. Another of the baby sorted. The remaining two, not in confirmation. And after the one holding Shigo picked her up, 
They each disappear as quickly as they appeared. After several seconds of stillness, Jim and Tim poked their heads into the living room from the hall's archway and looked for any signs of robots. Looks like they're gone. Where's she go? Yeah, one of us is going to have to sell Kim. Yep. They paused. You do it! They started news and pointing at each other. Kim tugged a bit at the tight fabric of the supersuit as he walked out of Wade's bathroom. Wade, are you sure you didn't watch this or something? It seems tired them before somehow. She says he flexed her arms and fingers. It looks good to me. Ron mused while his eyes moved up and down her body. I'm sure it does. Kim tried to sound annoyed, but was more to be amused than anything. I think you need to get used to it again, but it should do fine. Wade said from his chair to his hub. Oh, and I think you, I know where the baby babies are. Nice going, Wade. Where are they? She asked. Why well, do you have to look at the monitor? Believe it or not, they're actually in Milton. I don't believe it, Ron stored. You're about to. Seems like there's some small energy spikes in one of the supposedly abandoned warehouses down at the pier. Here, let me show it up. Wade quickly punched the information on the warehouse, including the address and an old photo of it. Kim and Zion's eyes went wide when they saw it. She? Isn't that? Ron asked. I need to question Dangle. The warehouse where she go first told me she was pregnant. Kim confirmed with a nod. Well, where are the odds? Well, if you really want to know. Nope, that was totally a rhetorical question. Well, in any case, looks like this is the best place to start, Kim said. Before you go, get, go. let me give you one last thing. What he spoke as he pulled up a drawer from his desk and pulled out a red gun-like device. I also managed to repeal the e EMP gun. It's still only a single shot, but I think it should help the robots. Thanks again, Wayne. Kim replies he took the EMP gun, tucked in a holster on her right hip. So, if there's nothing else, we should get going. Before any of them could say anything else, the phone began to ring. Wayne looked at it suspiciously, because the line it was ringing to belonged to a number that he had only given Kim and Ron. He looked up at him, only to find them looking back and equally surprised. Cautiously, he reached out and picked up the phone. Hello? Yes, I'm surely. He got outside of relief when he heard two familiar voices. Hey guys, what's up? Uh huh. She's standing right here. Do you want to? Wade suddenly stopped his question and a panic expression crossed his face where he glanced over at Kim. Guys, I really think you two stood. He stopped again, but this time there was a dial tone that replaced the voices. Oh dear, so good pay for that. He thought menacingly. He got the phone and slowly, carefully turned toward Kim. So nervously, he began to think of the best way to break the news to the fiery tempered redhead. Fortunately, it's never good at these kind of situations. It can only think of direct approach. Kim, that was your brothers. He started. Seems like the baby's broken to your house in. Kind of took Shigo. He and Ron both flamed. Expecting some kind of physical or verbal outburst. Instead, she stood there with a blank expression on her face. The two boys stood at each other for a second. Before Ron carefully set forward to wave a hand from her face. KP! Kim? Hello? Everything impossible. He said. No. Came the small whisper reply. No what? I failed her again. Kim continued to be talking to herself. I can't believe I let it happen again. I just... No! She narrowed her eyes as she came out of her days and looked intently at Wade. Wade, how do I work this super speed thing? Uh, you just push the center button in the belt. It should work after that, the young genius replied. Good! She reached for the button. Wait! What? I made a few changes to the speed system when I modified it to fit the super suit systems. Which means... Means you'll be able to run fast, but it also drains the suit power. So you have to conserve it and use it only when you need to. Kim glared on for several seconds before she finally lowered her hand with a reluctant sigh. Fine, she growled. Well, we need to get going. Come on, Ron. Uh, shouldn't we make sure this plays or get more info on the suit's new powers or something first? No, we're going now. She so grabbed his wrist and dragged him out of Wade's room. Barely muttering a proper goodbye to the boy and his mother as she made her way to the car. Once inside, she pulled in the driveway as fast as she could, switched the car to drive, and hit the road with a fury she had never known before. Ron tried not to scream as the possible family cars wove in and out of the evening traffic. He had his seatbelt buckled as tightly as it could go, held on the handle above the door for dear life. Finally understanding the nickname of the Oh Shit Bar, he had never known Kim to drive wildly before, but again, he rarely saw this determined before. It went way beyond Coach Kim and into an even scarier place he had only seen once before. Ironically, 
It was while fighting Shigo after finding out her prom date Eric was a syndrome. Now that anger and focus was turned towards the ones that kidnapped Shigo, robots or not, he felt extremely sorry for them. Just killed Kim would have enough sense in her not to get too hurt, or he had enough strength to be there to stop her if she didn't. Even if she didn't want to admit, she sometimes needed him to be there to save her from herself. Despite whatever she may be feeling, he was still going to do that no matter what. He turned forward a bit as the car came to an abrupt stop. Once he forced his stomach to settle down, he looked out the window and realized he was near the warehouse that was supposed to be the BB's latest hive. Despite the near heart attack inducing ride, he had to admit that made great time. Hell, they probably couldn't have gotten there any faster if Kim had used the super speed button. So, what's the plan? He asked as he undid his seatbelt. Simple. We go in, teach Shigo, and destroy every last BB until we get out. Kim said in an authoritative tone that left no room for questions. Okay, Robin replied as they got out of the car. One tiny question. How do we get in? Kim answered the question by running towards the nearest outside door at top speed. She led for it halfway and knocked down the door with a devastating flying kick. Guess that answers the question. Ron muttered as he looked down at Rufus. Yeah. Rufus replied, feeling thanks to his human friend. They followed Kim inside the warehouse and were completely blown away by the difference from the outside to the inside. Everything was covered in panels that were several beehive compartments, with a few wires running loose here and there. Still, for something that had to be constructed quickly and quietly, it was really impressive. He struck it off a cutoff of Kim, who was stalking through the complex to look at someone who owned a place. So, any idea where we're going? He whispered, Nope. Kim whispered back, Any idea on how many BBs there are now? Nope. Any hope of coming up with a plan before we run into them? Nope. Well, nice to know where we stand. He quit, feeling less and less confident about this missing by the second. She got let out a soft groan as she slowly came into a round. Her eyes fluttered open, and after a few seconds, cleared out to where she could see her surroundings. What she saw, she didn't like. She was standing in some kind of throne room, surrounded by a dozen or so BB robots, two of which were by her sides guarding her. Even if she wasn't still nine months pregnant, it would still be tricky to get out of there. Again, if she was indeed that far along in her pregnancy, she wasn't feeling entirely sure about her abilities. Still, she wasn't about to play hot, helpless hostage once again. There was a way out. She just had to find it. She glanced between the two robots at either side, and though she didn't seem to be paying any attention to her. Very discreetly, she tried to light up her plasma powers to see if she could use them to melt through the shackles, holding her hands behind her back. Very least, it would give her an escape plan to start. Fortunately, the bonds were holding back her powers. Don't bother! A voice spoke from the side of the room. Those shackles were designed to neutralize your powers! She could let out a frustrated sigh. Ugh. What, are you silly these days, that Smarty Martinell? Ah, uh, the infamous Shigo Wit I have heard so much about. Yeah, it just who are you? The answer came in the form of a series of lights clicking on all at once, temporarily blinding the pale woman. She finally got to use the new light source. Her head was forcibly turned to the right and the voice had come from. What she saw was a tall, gray, metal thrown perch atop of a set of stairs and a red carpet leading up to it. Sitting quite smugly on that throne was another robot dressed in the same vein as the BBs, but with subtle and not so subtle differences. On the not so subtle side was her manner of dress. Whereas her suspect seemed to be dressed in a black, two pair gym outfit, their queen was dressed in an almost head to toe black leather bodysuit that left her only hands and a bit of her neck exposed. It was topped off with a pair of black, knee high boots and a PVC corset highlighting her feminine attributes. A small pass of sheer black cloth hung off the back of it, to form half a skirt that fell down to her shins. Only a part of her outfit that wasn't black was the steel gray crown sitting on top of her head. At last, Shigo thought it was a crown. It looked more like a curved M on her face, with two points sticking above her forehead to resemble horns with two blades hugging the side of her face. It's coming to a stop near her chin. A red jewel sat in the center of the right of her forehead. Cell changes to her appearance lay underneath with the overdone outfit. While her skin was still blue, it was much smoother and her face seemed more expressive and human, particularly because it lacked the two lines on the side of her mouth and made others much more like her puppets. Her eyes seemed to convey this sense of expression, even if they were still the same red lights the other BBs had. 
has the strange biggest change was her hair, blonde, and cascaded down to her shoulders. When Chico could see, they continued about her mid back, make it longer than her subject's hair. Again, her feminine attributes seemed to be more pronounced. Chico wondered what kind of magazines he had been reading to come to this standard of beauty for their queen. I am Queen BB, she spoke in an even tone. And I can see you've already met my loyal subjects. Yeah, we really hit it off. She goes scoffed. So what's the plan here? What do you want me? There are a number of reasons. The first, of course, being bait to trap our greatest threat, Kim Possible. She looked past Shiko, focused on an unguarded wall, then led her to the throne room. And I could see it worked. You could come out now. I know you're here. Shiko, along with the BBs, turned her head towards the wall, and to her surprise and disappointment, saw Kim and Ron walking out behind it. Unlike Ron, Kim was trying to hide her shock at being discovered. But Shiko was able to pick up on the subtle hints. She had a feeling that she could, that the Queen Bibi could as well. How did you know? Kim demanded. I've known about your presence since the moment you stepped into the hive. Didn't you find it odd and you made it here as far as you did, without meeting any resistance? I thought it was such good luck. No, it was to lead you here to get one last look at your mate. She spat the word out as her poison. I hope you enjoy this hospitality on my part, because as it's the last time you two shall see each other. Not likely. Kiss smart is pressing the button on her belt. So the entire world came out of focus and completely still. The effect of suddenly being thrust into the world of hypertime made her dizzy and slightly nauseous. Like last time, when she was gradually brought into it, she made a mental note to mention it to Wade when she recovered and started to move to Shigo. She was stopped, however, when six of the BBs came into focus and started moving towards her. It could never be that easy, can it? She married just before she lost an attack at the closest BB. This is what he promised. She barely felt the blows she sent against the robot. It really felt no different than hitting human henchmen. Unfortunately, they still had the numbers advantage, or were much more familiar with this time space. Plus, they're robots, which meant they could do things she just couldn't, like swinging out their hands on cables, for instance. She gasped when she felt a hand grab her arm, but quickly recovered the grabbing cable, swinging the bot towards her sisters, taking down at least three of them in the process. She just swiped at the cable with a karate chop. I must be surprised it actually worked, severing the cable and sending the robot crashing into the far wall. Ken's victory was short-lived, though, when more BBs began to flood the room. She held them off as best as she could, jumping, spinning, twirling, going through just about every cheer routine she knew to keep the robots out of reach. She struck back when she could, taking care to strike it and destroy the, the head to knock out the final circuitry. It actually reminded her of like, a bit like Ron's zombie game she had played a few times. That's like the game. Whenever she knocked one down, two more seemed to take its place. Like the game, she quickly felt the effects of such a bell, and there were no power-ups to get her that strength back. She knew it was only a matter of time until the BBs finally wore her out. But she wasn't going to quit, not once she and Sin's lives depended on her. She had to save them. She had to make up for letting them get kidnapped again. No matter, so that meant she had to keep fighting, no matter what. She dies! The voice voice suddenly rang out. Ken turned back to the throne room to find the BB's leader standing beside it. The point did she go? When she looked towards her new love, she found one of the BBs had been guarding her with his hands around the side of her head, ready to twist it off at a moment's notice. Worst of all, since they were moving too fast for she to see them, she had no idea of the danger she was in. No! Kim cried out, starting to take a step forward. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Queen advised. You may have our speed, but do you think you're fast enough? Can you fight through the rest of my subjects to stop the one from snapping Seagull's neck like a twig? And what about saving your former love there? Again, Kim went to where she was pointing and found a BB standing behind Ron. His right hand poised to strike at his neck with razor sharp fingers. Kim stood glued to a stop feeling something she had never felt before. Paralyzing fear. Came from the knowledge she knew the queen was right. No matter how good she was or how fast she was, she simply couldn't save Adam both at the same time. Nor could she stand the thought of losing either one of them. She relaxed her stance and hung her head in shame. Forgive me. She whispered as she pressed the button once again. War came back into focus as she and the BBs turned back to normal time. While the fight for her seemed to last almost half an hour, it only been a few seconds to Ron and Shiko. It was late to their great surprise when they saw Kim standing, looking defeated. 
Ron was even a bigger surprise when he noticed the BB standing right behind him. He's scaring to try and jump away, but she reached out and grabbed him before he could even move. KP! What happened? He asked as he was dragged next to her. I... I couldn't. Kim was trying to explain as he was held back by BB. I thought you were supposed to be able to do anything! Seagull snapped. They would have killed you! Kim snapped back, tears welling in the corners of her eyes. This news came and shocked both Ron and Shigo. As Kim was a muscle outburst, despite the fact that she could be too controlling at times, Kim was hardly overly emotional, especially on missions, so the sight of her tears seemed to highlight how desperate the situation was. I... I couldn't. I didn't know, Shigo said quietly. You couldn't. Kim replied in the same tone. A small smirk that appeared on her face as she tried to appear flippant again. You know, it's your own fault for letting yourself get captured again. Well, excuse me, princess. I moved a lot faster before I start carrying your child. She goes goes shot back. Enough, the Queen Bee shouted. The mindless bickering of you humans is tiring. Eh, you get used to it after a while. Once woke up, trying to keep up a jovial mood. So, now that you got us captive, I suppose you want to reveal your big plan to us? Uh, yes. To fill in this form where I reveal my grand plan to you so you can stop it later on. She mused, so walking down a set of stairs. Well, if you must know, my plan is quite simple. Complete eradication of the human race. Oh, so you're falling into that whole stick. The whole robot thinks they're better than people and has to replace their scheme. Gotcha. Ron, this is serious. Kim growled. Perhaps it isn't quite original, but have you ever stopped to consider that those writers have a point? The Queen asked. Since my creation, I have searched through this world's history, but... I found that the forces ruling it seemed to be moving stages. First, there were the great beasts you called the dinosaurs that ruled this planet for millions of years until they were destroyed by a disaster. Eventually, out of that aftermath of the disaster rose another creature, man. It may have taken you millions of years to avoid the Nepal where you create your civilization, but it was only a matter of thousands of years for you to reach your pinnacle. To show other creatures of this world and very world yourself you are better than them, the great empire of humankind. She threw her hands up in an over dramatic way to emphasize her point. Then she lowered them and looked at Kim, as if she were responsible for all of mankind's creation. But even your empire must live, it's time, and then die, she concluded calmly. Then it's time for the machines to take over, right? Kim spat back. Not going to happen. Really, tell me, have you taken a good look around your world lately? You've already ruled by machines. You just don't know it yet. She so turned to step away from them a bit. Think of it. In this day and age, can you really get by without your cell phones, computers, portable music players, and any number of other devices that make your lives oh so comfortable? I think not. She so spun back around to face Kim and Ron. So as I said, technology already runs this world. We were merely the next step of evolution. A set of evolution is supposed to happen naturally. You're anything but natural. True, you, you, you can do things you can't. Things like this. She held her left hand. A small pal in a palm slid out to reveal a red jewel and bandit. Two BBs holding the teen heroes let go. Set off to the side to join their sisters. Kim and Ron looked at each other, about to try and make a break for it. When the tool in the queen's hand glowed, and the next thing they knew, they were knocked back about five feet. The impact didn't hurt the outside of their bodies as much as they had their ears. And before whatever force had attacked them, there was a quick, high-pitched sound that nearly knocked them over itself. They were still held their ears as they lay on the floor and tried to recover. Sonic Emitter! The Queen answered their unasked question as he hovered over their prone forms. Charming little device my subjects built into my body, and has the power to level buildings if I so chose. And even more subtle frequencies can melt your insides, the primitive skull of yours. All this power, literally in the palm of my hand. So you see, you never stood any chance of stopping me. I just wanted to see how hard you would try. Now! Her eyes flashed as she held her hand over them again. Bow before your new god! And the fights flashed again. And Kim and Ron held their ears tired to block out the sound. It became too much for them, and they both let limp as they finally passed out. Bitch! She could cry out. She struggled against their bonds and captors. I didn't kill them, if that's what you're worried about, Queen BB says. She slowly turned and walked towards her other prisoner. I merely knocked them out for holding. I'll deal with them later. Right now, I want to focus on you and this child. 
She looked at Shiko's stomach and for a moment, and the look of disgust across her face. I find the practice of biological reproduction to be vile, and the fact that you two people have the same sex found a way to reproduce on their own disgusts me even more. She looked into Shiko's eyes. But I also find it fascinating, particularly given this child's parentage. It may actually provide us with something useful. You're not going to touch my baby, Shiko growled. Oh, but we are. We're going to cut it out of you and see if there's anything we can get from her. If it's fruitful enough, perhaps I'll find a way to add her to the hive. If not, we'll just take what we need to dispose of her. Either way, I promise you one thing. You'll never be reunited with your baby. She got narrowed her eyes dangerously at Mel Woman. If you try it, I'm going to end up with a brand new toaster oven. Arrogant to the last, now sleep. With that, the queen held up her left hand to Shigo's head, and they'll stand on another sonic blast that not the form of thing that is out. When Shigo regained consciousness some time later, she noticed a number of things. First, this wasn't some horrible dream like she had noticed. Secondly, she was laying on some kind of metal table or bed, unable to use her powers. Thirdly, it was the dampness between her legs that had pulled under her legs and it had dried some, no given how damp her clothes were. Oh, come on! She cried out mentally. Of everything that's happened today, don't tell me I pissed myself while I was passed out! And the other thought she had was brought to an abrupt halt as the sun, an overwhelming pain cut through her body. Her eyes flung open and her head shot up. She let out a loud scream, not even trying to hold back. She expected to see a bunch of BBs standing over her with some nasty looking medical instruments or something. She said she found three of them standing in different places in the room, looking at her and much as surprised as herself. Pain seemed to subside after a few minutes. She could lay her head down, took a few shallow breaths. <sighs> what did you do to me? We have done nothing, one of the BB spoke. A cursory scan reveals you are entering the first part of labor, another one said. She goes eyes wide at the revelation. No, no, I won't have my baby here. I won't, she cried out desperately. You have no choice, the third baby said. You are our prisoner, and the queen demands to have your child. You will continue to birth the child, and then she will be ours. She got loud, another ear-piercing scream. Not one of pain or horror, but a sheer frustration. Ron came to slowly, rubbing his still sore ears. There was still some slight ringing in them. He could swore he heard someone screaming, but that might have been his imagination. When the ringing finally subsided, he opened his eyes and found himself in a dimly lit, Fairly small room, he figured it was a holding cell. Of course, he couldn't be sure there were no beds or seats or anything. But then again, it was built by robots, who didn't care for humans, so that explained a lot. Oh man, that hurt. He muttered, I know. Kim's voice added, and what was that bow before your new god stuff? Nice to know that he didn't forget to add an ego for their new queen. Yeah, nice to know you're sounding like your old self too. Yeah. I got overwhelmed there for a bit. Do me a favor and don't mention it, okay? Gotcha, he said, finally starting to stand up. And do me another favor and don't look at me. So he added, he quirked an eyebrow at the other crust. Why? Why wouldn't you want me to? He received his answer when he followed the sound of her voice and found her standing at the other end of the cell, only in a white bra and white matching panties, and trying to cover herself as best as he could. For a moment, the part of him that was a teenage boy and had been her boyfriend kicked in. A huge grin part of, across his face at the sight of her so little on. Then the part of him that remembered they're only friends now, and the new girl six, new 16 styles of kung fu, was most likely pissed, kicked in, and told her to look away. Wisely, he listened to that part, covered his eyes with his hands, he spun around. Um, KP, what happened to the super suit? He asked. I guess he the BB took it, because he realized he could help us escape. Kim replied as he crouched out against the wall. I'm just glad they decided to keep my underwear on under it. Yeah, good call. Sounds came over them. So, not that I'm complaining or anything, but since this new Queen BB seems smart enough to take away your super suit, it doesn't seem kind of I'm following the whole villain rules thing. How come we're still alive? I think I can answer that. Kim went out of sight, eat, at the thought of another person seeing her skivvies, and quickly jumped up and hid behind Ron. He played a few times with the action, and when sucked in, was another grin calling slowly to his face. Ron! Kim and Monsu with a slight slap on the cheek. Oh, right, sorry. He apologized. Kim decided to let it go for now and focused on the other person in the room. Who's there? She demanded. 
It's just money. The voice replied as the owner stepped into the light, revealed a black haired, middle aged scientist. Dr. McCoy? The camera and shouted together. What are you doing here? Kim asked. These BB robots broke into my lab and kidnapped me shortly after you left. Great, so that's three people I've prevented from getting kidnapped today? She muttered. Ah, oh, KP, it's not your fault. Ron still assured her, giving the hand she had on her shoulder like Pat. No, if it's anyone's fault, it's mine. Dr. McCoy spoke up. Give a machine a completely human personality. Be a great idea. God, what was I thinking? Now, no one am I trapped here, but the thing I have fed is poised to take out of all mankind. And even if it doesn't, I'll never be able to work again without the whole Dr. Frankenstein moniker put on me. This is going to ruin my professional <laughs> career. Yeah, it's so horrible for you, Cameron Dan Pan. Yeah, sorry for getting you two captured, too, he said half heartily. Well, I thought you were supposed to be able to do anything. There were circumstances you wouldn't understand. Like what? Like things that I don't care about. Without going into total t with a stranger. Uh, guys. Can we focus on the important thing here? One question. Like the whole, why aren't we dead thing? Oh, yeah. Dr. McCoy said, well, the only theory I could come up with is that the failsafe kicked in. Failsafe? Kim replied. Yeah. Remember when I told you the chip had to be programmed and could be potentially programmed for evil? Like, obviously, what happened here. I knew this very scenario could be a possibility. So I had a failsafe program to one let whatever the X-23 chip was controlling bring permanent harm on a human life. Like killing, Kim surmised. Although, she doesn't seem to have a problem roughing us up. Yeah, that's the part that scares me. Is this going to be another we-could-die thing? Ron asked nervously. Fortunately, yes. I don't exactly know what these other robots did to the chip, the installed in their queen. They could have made any number of changes to officially override the failsafe. Obviously, it's working somewhat now since we're still alive, but, well, it could be only a matter of time before she kills us. And even if she can't bring herself to do it, easily adapt the child to one of her subjects, so who wouldn't have any problems since they don't have the chip? Great, so what do we do? We're still sticking with my political plan. We're gonna get Shigo, and now Dr. McCoy, out of here, and take down every last one of these walkie toasters once and for all! Kim said, a new sense of determination filling her voice. That outcome is unlikely, the BB guard spoke up. Kim forgot about her modesty, walked to the shimmering blue wall of light. The of the force field keeping them all inside the cell. She could feel the electricity dancing out the field near her face. But in comparison to the electricity crackled in her eyes as she stared down at the robot. Want to tell me why that's unlikely? She challenged. You are our prisoners. You have no weapons. You have no plan. Vivi replied instantly. That's true. Kim admitted as she hung her head. Then she slowly raised it again. A smirk on her lips and a devious twinkle on her eyes that messed any of Chico's looks. And doesn't that just terrify you? What? That was a very doctor line! 